Will you pray with me? Speak now, Holy One, through words ancient and modern. Give them new life and new relevance for our lives as we live them in these days. In your many names we pray. Amen. In this second pandemic Easter season, we've been exploring gracism and what it means to be a gracist. Inspired by the title of Dr. David Anderson's book, my hope is that as disciples of Jesus, we might discover how to become gracists in whom true light and life is resurrected. Resurrection people believe that light overcomes darkness, life is stronger than death, and love is the ultimate antidote for hate. Dr. King tried to teach us that hate cannot drive out hate, so as practicing gracist, we are learning how to live in the world in such a way that racism, sexism, homophobia, and other prejudices have no place in our lives or our world. We cannot throw darkness out of a room, but each of us can let a bit more light flow into the world through us. So too, no matter how intelligent or educated we are, we cannot intellectually scour the prejudices of society from the deep places of our souls. However, I believe grace and relentlessly practicing gracism may well be the light that can drive out the darkness both in our souls and in our world. As all of you know, I spent two decades in Texas at the world's largest LGBTQ church. In that capacity, I tried to combat homophobia by preaching sermons, teaching classes, writing books, debating fundamentalist preachers, and creating the only nationally televised TV special. The church grew tremendously despite the onslaught of AIDS. In the early days of that disease, many fundamentalist preachers claimed that it was God's curse on homosexuals. Of course, they never explained why lesbians were the least likely to contract it and why it still remains an overwhelmingly heterosexual disease in Africa. During that season, there was a tremendous need for gracism in the LGBTQ community and I suspect that remains so today. In Dallas, I thought I'd done my job pretty well, but time and again, as I sat with a young man dying of AIDS, he would confess that he was still afraid God's love didn't include him. You see, internalized prejudice, even against yourself, doesn't yield easily or fully to rational arguments. Gracism is a lifelong journey for us all. One of the most effective tools that I discovered in my struggle against faith-based homophobia was the Bible itself. LGBTQ Southerners had often had scriptures used as a weapon against them. So whenever I was able to help them hear stories in new ways, there was a sliver of light that drove out a little bit more darkness. The story you heard today from the book of Acts that Vicki read a moment ago was one of those liberating words that most people have never really heard. Oh, the story has been used by evangelicals as an illustration of how we need to witness to those they consider lost, but they seem to miss the core message of liberation in this story. As a gay man who grew up in the church, this is certainly not a scripture that I heard in Sunday school, at least not the way I understand it now. This is the story from the faith journey of someone who I believe was the first black gay Christian recorded in the Bible. In today's story, Philip is led by the Spirit to a man sitting in a chariot. We don't know this man's name, 
but we do know a good bit about him. First, he was apparently a Jewish convert because when Philip met him, he's reading from the Hebrew book of the prophet Isaiah. And we also know that he was an important person, a person of means, because he has a car and a driver. And he is educated because he is an accountant and he is reading in a language that is not spoken in his home country of Ethiopia. And finally, he was most likely a black man because in that day, Ethiopia was a nation of dark-skinned people. And he could well have been a homosexual. Oh, we don't know that for certain, but we know that he was a eunuch, which means that he was sexually marginalized. Eunuchs weren't allowed to worship in the temple, for example, despite the fact that there is an extraordinary promise in Isaiah 56, a passage from which Jesus quoted. For thus say it, says the Lord to those eunuchs who keep my Sabbath, who choose the things that please me and hold fast to my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. We usually think of eunuchs as enslaved, castrated men. But even in the ancient world, that was very rare, so rare that it would have been odd for Isaiah and then Jesus to talk about them. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus says there are three types of eunuchs. Those born eunuchs, those made eunuchs, that is, those who were castrated slaves, and those who choose to be eunuchs for the sake of the realm of God, that is, those who are called to celibacy. In that day, the word eunuch often simply referred to men who did not or could not father children. There were slaves forcibly prevented from fathering children. There were religious people who chose celibacy, and there were those who, because of who they were born to be, did not father children. That last category, many scholars believe, refers to homosexual men who often served women in the royal household. You see, the reason this third category served the queen is because, well, even a castrated slave might commit rape, but she was pretty safe around gay men. Acts makes it clear that this man was a eunuch in service of Candace, the queen of Ethiopia. This story tells us a lot about this man in the chariot reading Isaiah, but I think it tells us even more about Philip. Philip was someone who followed the urging of the Spirit of God, and he was able to do this freely because he was a gracist. No matter what others thought or said, Philip was convinced of the radically inclusive nature of the grace of God. Philip included in the family of faith someone who was a different class, a different nationality, a different race, and probably even a different sexuality. Grace had set Philip free, so he never paused for one second to wonder if he shouldn't set another sibling free. Perhaps Jesus offered us a clue about how Philip became so liberated and liberating a gracist. In the gospel lesson, Jesus said, abide in me and I will abide in you. In the same way that a branch can't bear fruit by itself, but only by being joined to the vine, so you can only bear fruit to the extent that you are joined to me. Maybe that's how Philip learned to be free. He learned he was not the source of life. 
but only an expression of it. Rather than thinking he needed to be judge and jury for life and the life others lived, he simply decided to abide in life and let that light and life flow through him to whomever it wished. No, we can't throw out darkness no matter how hard we try. But we can let our lives be filled with so much light and life and love that there really isn't room for anything else. Remember that we aren't the source of life, even the life that flows through us. Remembering that might help us to remember that we aren't the source of the life that flows through others either. But we do all share the same source. When I was in high school, I worked at the local Piggly Wiggly. One day, one of my fellow employees, a man named Tommy, he was in a terrible automobile accident. Tommy and his wife both worked at the store and they had four kids. Tommy was the hardest working man I had ever met because as a black man in the rural South, he had to work three jobs just to support his family. After his accident, they asked store employees to sign up to give blood. A few days passed and the store manager stopped me and said, Mike, you're 17, aren't you? Yes, sir, I said. Then why haven't you signed up to give blood for Tommy? You aren't afraid, are you? No, sir, not really, I answered. Then, demonstrating my teenage ignorance or perhaps prejudice, I said, I didn't think I could give him my blood because I'm white and he's black. The manager snorted and said, yeah, but all blood is red. And so it is. The life that flows through us all is from the same vine. And that may be the story they didn't tell you in Sunday school, but as a gracist, it is our story, and we all need to tell it. Amen.